In the mid-1800s in Bristol, England, these buildings became home to more than 2,000 homeless boys and girls. A man named George Mueller built them on prayer and faith, trusting God alone to provide food and shelter he never made an appeal for money. Here in Bristol, England, discover the remarkable story of a man who became a father to thousands of orphan children. The legacy of George Mueller on this day of discovery. Bristol, England, a busy industrial, commercial, and business city, where Isambard Kingdom Brunel created the very first propeller to drive a sea ship across the oceans, where he created the first suspension bridge to cross a gorge. And even in recent years, Bristol gave birth to the fastest passenger commercial airline in existence, the Concorde. And yet Bristol wasn't always like that. There were times when this city was Dickensian, all of a twist type of a society, dirty streets, dark streets, a waterfront, shipping area, lots of crime, and above all, lots of unwanted children just thrown out onto the streets with nowhere to go and nobody wanting them. And into that pitiful society of workhouses and poor houses stepped a man that changed that entire society and his name was George Mueller. And here at Ashley Downs is the remains of his complex of massive buildings that housed up to 2,000 orphans at one time. I want to tell you about George Mueller and about the faith principles that he believed in in order to help him to accomplish all of this through God. And where better to do it than in Mueller House at the Mueller Museum. This is the George Mueller Museum. It's filled with the memories of one of Bristol's most renowned sons. More than a century ago, George Mueller and his wife Mary set out to help the homeless children of their community. In their day, there were no laws protecting children from the labor houses and factories. Living and working conditions, especially for street children, were unimaginable. The Mueller's believed that as they reached out to these unloved children and embraced this overwhelming challenge, their God and Heavenly Father would provide all they would need. They never once asked for money. I gladly pass through all these trials of faith with regard to means, if he only might be glorified and his church and the world benefited. I commit the whole work to him and he will provide me with what I need in future also I know not whence the means are to come. And the needs of the children were met at just the right time and sometimes at the last moment. One morning as the children gathered for breakfast, they were unaware that there was no food left in the orphanage. As they waited for their morning meal, Mr. Mueller calmly said, Children, you know we must be in time for school. Lifting his hand, he said, Dear Father, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. And as he finished praying, there was a knock on the door. A baker entered. Having sensed God was urging him to do so, he had baked bread through the night for the children. Then there was a second knock at the door. It was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage. He gave the children his cans of fresh milk so his wagon could be emptied and repaired. Throughout all his years of service at the orphanage, the needs of those Mueller sheltered were always met. Today, the buildings of Ashley Downs stand as a lasting reminder of what God can do through a man completely dependent on him. A wonderful room full of so many things about one man who had such a terrific effect upon this city, as well as the country, as well as the world. 
so much about him here. Even this, his original desk. And when I think of George Mueller as the man of prayer and faith, and think of him sitting here at this desk and saying just a prayer to God, and then waiting for it to be answered. It's staggering. Who was he? He was actually a German. As a very young man in a house group in Germany, he found faith in Christ. And without hesitation, he knew he was committed to making Christ known and actually volunteered to be a missionary. And he left Germany and came here to Britain, primarily to work amongst Jewish people in London. But his health broke down. Things like that happen in the Christian life that are part of God's purpose. Even at the time, you don't think about it. And it moved him to this part of the world for health, where he took on being the pastor of a little church. And it was there he had his first collision with faith and the needs of faith to be met. And he decided not to be paid by people paying for the seat in church, but just a box at the back. And then he went from there. And it was in the course of all of that ministry that he became a man confronted with the tremendous needs of those children we discussed here in Bristol. Orphans, throwaways, people that people didn't want. And they were just chucked out into the streets, went to workhouses, and they did have to work. It was child labor, and just for a bed and some gruel, an existence. And he felt that they deserved better than that, and set his heart, because he was challenged by just a simple text in the epistle of James, that you should be looking after the orphans and widows in their affliction. And he saw not only an affliction of physical need, he saw that every one of those children were people, and they needed their emotional needs met, as well as spiritual needs met. And it was at a time like that that Mueller decided, I have to do something about those children. And that's where all this began. And that foundation still exists today. He was born in 1805, started his work here in 1835. And they even presented him with that desk there on his 90th birthday. The orphans gave it to him because they loved him for everything that he ever did. He learned so much about the principles of faith and prayer at that desk. And even here in this case, you find his Bibles well worn and used and with his own handwriting. Bells that the children used in their services to play hymns. And even over here, things that speak of a man that they loved, even to his glasses, a lock of his hair, and pictures keys, and here are the pictures, children, all ages, that came from nothing, right off the streets. And even under here, we discovered the original records, every piece of paper that had to do with any child that ever came through here from 1835 on is still here, total records of a man that knew what it was to care for those that were not wanted. Orphans that needed everything in life, they needed to be adopted. Dear sir, may you long be spared to be a father to the fatherless and a friend to the orphan. Often do I look back on my childhood spent in the orphan house and feel grateful that I was one of the number permitted to find shelter in so good a home. Yes, George Muller was quite a man, a man of devotion, a man of very deep prayer. And even when I became a Christian, 
He was one of the first characters that I ever heard about that really impressed me. A man who prayed in total dependence upon God and his prayers were answered. And just to think that over a hundred years ago, that man sat at this very desk and here with his Bible, reading, learning, getting to know God intimately. And his notes are still written in the pages. Jacob is my servant. I will help him. Having written that and underlined that, it obviously spoke to him because he knew that God would help him because he was his servant. The first and primary object of the work was to show before the whole world and the whole Church of Christ that the living God is ready to prove himself as the living God by being ever willing to help, comfort, and answer the prayers of those who trust in him. The marvelous thing about Mueller's dependence upon God for everything is that that spilled through. It began to affect the lives of the children and they too began to see that you could depend on another. And in actual fact, they ended up depending on George Mueller. He became their father figure. This wasn't a dream for an institution. It was a home. It was a place where these unwarranted street urchins, people from the poorhouse and the workhouse, could find a home and a father. And they knew that he was dependent on his father in heaven. And they depended on him. And he taught them the principle of going beyond him to discovering they too could be adopted by God. And that they could belong to God and not just to George Mueller. And that prayers of dependence was for everything their education, their upbringing, new buildings. And here at this desk, with a bowed head and a closed eye, he simply told his Heavenly Father. And the kids saw it happening all around them. And they began to feel at last that they belonged. They had a home. They were loved. Dear Sir, I thank you for the education, food, clothing, and for every comfort, but above all, for the instruction from God's Word, which I received in that happy orphan house, for it was there that I was brought to know Jesus as my Saviour. I hope that you will be spared many more years to care for poor, destitute children like me. I hope to prosper in my trade, and thereby show my gratitude for all your kindness. With all my kind love, I am, dear Sir, yours gratefully. Yes, we're a long way removed from George Mueller's day when he ran his homes. And in that time, he looked after almost 10,000 or more orphans and had a house big enough to house 2,000 at one time. And the amazing thing is that that involves some $7 million in cash and every penny was received by faith in total dependence upon God and not asked for. And yet today, his kind of faith and praying and dependence upon God would put many of the Christian institutions and other institutions to shame today as to how they go about their provision. But he depended on God. But there was one thing that's still the same today as then. That's the children. And not only children, today even goes through to people in their adulthood. Children and people that don't belong, that have no home, that have no parentage. And some even go through life like that. But today we don't need orphanages. We don't have the children to put in them. We've got new methods. We just abort and get rid of them. 
or we create government welfare schemes, clinical means of taking care of the unwanted until the day of their 18th birthday when they're thrust out into a world and still none of those inner needs and personal needs having been cared for. They've created a fostering system and even the foster parents in their preparation to be foster parents are made clinical parents to just keep them and look after them with government monies until they're 18. Dear sir, I have been taught by your life that there is something truly noble and grand for a man to live for. There is nothing more noble than the cause for which you have spent and are still spending your valuable life, for which cause I hope to spend mine, namely the cause of Christ. And as I go through all these archives of pictures and handwritten letters by the children, all down the years, some of them even have their marriage pictures here. On the faces of each one of them, there is a happiness because they belonged. And I don't disparage today's efforts by foster parents to look after children. And I know that every foster parent that does, does it with all their heart and wants to do their best. I know because my wife and I, we were registered with the Lancashire County Council as foster parents. But I can also remember the training we were given. And we were told quite definitely never to become attached to the child. There was state property. And of course I can see the need for that. The child needed the love. The child needed more than just a place to stay in food, clothes, and off to school and an education until they were 18. They needed that belonging. They needed love. They needed spiritual needs met. They needed everything of that kind. And I knew that that's what the child needed. But I can understand them making us not have an attachment. Because I was away one weekend and when I came home, found my wife distraught. The boy had gone. Where? They came and took him away. He was their property. Took us 19 years before we found him again and discovered that he still looked upon my wife and I as his mum and dad. But when we asked him what had happened, because we were never given an explanation, we were never allowed to keep in touch, we'd done our duty. We found that it was some half-connected relative that decided they wanted him. And in those days, the law was on their side. And they could come and rip him out of your home and your heart and just hand him over technically to a relative. But that's not what they needed. They needed total adoption. They needed to have someone to hold on to. Well, all these homes are gone now. But our world is still full of people, even adults that long to have those things, security, love, a home, belonging, to be wanted, and they don't have it. And what they really do need is not just a place to stay, they need to be adopted. I've just been sitting back at George's desk says here they gave it to him on his 90th birthday. The whole desk is just full of memories of the provision of God. Even these Bibles. Indications of the very provision of a wife. Records, one book after another. Some of them very, very old. Lists of names. This one here list of names of folks that belonged in Mueller's homes. Even a box here 
and it says on it, for the orphans. I mean, those of you watching the program today, wouldn't you like to have your name in a book like this as a proof that you belonged? Are you looking at that very title for the orphans and wondering, what is there for me? I mean, don't you have homes? Yes, of course you do. And some of you who feel unwanted and long for some sort of adoption, you have nice homes, wealthy homes. You've been brought up by parents to have your own room, your own credit card, your own car. You've been trained to be independent. Actually, that means not to belong. And in some cases, parents hope that you'll hurry up and move out to 18 so that they can go and do their own thing, which in some cases is usually divorce. But at least you're off their hands. And my own dad died, and I was in my 50s. Sometimes people misunderstood that I didn't break down and cry. And that was because I had done all my crying when he made me leave home many, many years before. But I almost found it amusing because I suddenly discovered in my 50s even I was still looking for a daddy. Somebody that would just pick me up, put me on his knee, hug me, tell me he loved me. I never ever got that myself. So I do know what this is all about. I'd have loved my name to have been recorded here. That I belonged. That there was something for this orphan. And yet, like Mueller, in my own utter dependence upon God, I've discovered that God has been my Father and taken care of everything. You see, it's what we've been trying to tell you all through this program that there is still an adoption agency that is in existence. But it's not in buildings, in rooms, and people, and provision. Nowadays, it's God who's doing the adopting. He has his own agency for allowing a person to become his child and have their name in his book, the Lamb's Book of Life. God's adoption agency. I'd like to tell you about that. Do you know what's in here? I couldn't believe it when I opened this. It is the complete records, all the books, with the names and details and case histories of every child that ever came through Mueller's homes. When they came, when they left, it's all in here. Look at this one. Number one, Charlotte Hill, April the 11th, 1836. All handwritten details about the history of every child. And that verse that I quoted about Revelations Book of Life just shot right back through my head again. All the records of those that were adopted into Mueller's homes, and God has his record of all those that were adopted into his family. Not only that, but I found that in opening them up, it not only had the details of when the child was born, when he came here, when he left, but also whether he went to a home, whether he got married. But one interesting detail, a believer. At another child, the last detail, not, even with an exclamation mark. Yes, they even detailed whether or not during the course of the stay in Mueller's homes, they put their faith and trust in Christ and got adopted into his family. Hey, when that biggest book is opened in the heavens, is your name 
recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, because you have acknowledged your need of God as a Father and believe what the Scripture says, that there's only one way for that to happen. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And it's only as we recognize Christ as our Redeemer, the one who died on the cross for us, took the punishment for our sinfulness, rose again from the dead to come into our hearts and lives to give us the power of new living, every emotional, physical, spiritual need satisfied through him, but above all, allowing us to be adopted into his family and knowing with absolute confidence that on the judgment day when the books are opened, our names are going to be in his book of life. Will your name be there? Quite honestly, will your name be in the Lamb's book of life? Or would it be written under your record? Not. Do you realize what it's like to go out into a lost eternity, never belonging, when you can for all eternity belong to the biggest heavenly family in the whole of existence, God's family? I'm in that family. He's my father. Is he yours? And if he isn't, all it takes is a moment of your time right now to say, Father, I want to be your child. Please adopt me. Christ, thank you for making that possible. Be my Redeemer, Savior, and Lord. Go on, do it, and be adopted. Just in time, George Mueller's needs were met. As he prayed in total dependence on God, his requests were answered in amazing ways.